I'm going to share the um, the schedule a little after this live, but I have put it onto my page if you are um, following my Kelly Brown Little Pieces Photography page. But yeah, hi. If you are watching, let me know where you're watching from. And I hope you all had a, a nice weekend, as good as can be, and made the most of that time. I, uh, I ca actually caught up on quite a few things at home and I did a little more crafting as well. I've got some new patterns I'm going to be sharing with you all this week and for some new newborn rompers and things like that and the new bonnet which is very exciting. I have loved seeing everyone's creations and their upcycling of old clothes here in the group. That's been really cool to see. And yeah, so today I thought I would share with you uh, how I'm going to edit the photos that I took on the 3rd of April of my kids. If you remember that live video that we did, that was a little fun, a little hectic, a little crazy with the two dogs as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, and if you have any questions at all throughout this live video, pop them into the comments below. We are going to be editing in Photoshop and I'm going to be using some of my actions and talking about, you know, how I can sort of get the most out of the photographs that I took and show you what I do there. We've got someone from Melbourne, Sydney. We've got someone in, how do you say that? Bethalto. Bethalto? USA, hi. So we've got a few people from all over. This is really cool. Um, anyway, if you did watch that live and you saw that I was trying to capture a photograph of the kids with the dogs, um, it was very unsuccessful, but once we finished filming, I actually, and when the excitement kind of calmed down because my twins were very excited to be live, um, I'll bring up a photograph that I took afterwards because um, I just thought that this was the funniest expression on little Rocky's face. The twins were pretty happy about uh, him finally calming down and wanting to be in a photograph. But the dogs seriously get so excited when they come into the studio. It is like a giant playground for them. And I'm not just talking my studio space where I shoot. Uh, this is a two-story building and there's stairs at both ends, so they do laps. They go up one set of stairs and tear around and come down the other set of stairs. So it is literally like a giant playground for them. So, and they hadn't been here for a long time. So that's why they were so excited and we didn't have any treats on hand for them to uh, listen to us. But yeah, I wanted to show you, I did actually manage to catch a, a photograph of the twins and little Rocky. Ah, Lee, on the other hand, he was uh, not, not so interested. He wasn't having a good day. <laughs> he definitely wasn't. All right, so we do have a lot planned for you this week. Um, and today, like I said, we're going to edit some photos. So if you've got those questions, pop them into the group and I'm not gonna drag this out too long. So we'll go ahead. I've got my two raw files here sitting on my desktop and I'm gonna open those up with Photoshop. Now, I know a lot of you will take your photographs into Lightroom, make some adjustments there and so forth. And that's fine, honestly. There are so many different ways to get the most out of the different editing programs that we use. And how I do it might not necessarily be the same way that you do it, and that's okay. I have been editing, obviously, for, for many, many years, and I just do it my way because it's quick and easy, and I would rather be doing other things than sitting in front of my computer editing. So for me, to speed up my editing process, I think the most important thing is getting it right in camera and it's getting your exposure right. Now, I'm looking here at this photograph and the way that I lit it, I wanted it to be nice and moody and I wanted you know, it to be sort of, um, I don't know, really kind of contrasted to bring out those strong sort of bone, bone structure features, those, that jawline of his. Now, my twins are 13, going on 14, and I wanted to capture them in a way, if you missed the live, that was really, really um, simple and more about them and a portrait that they would be happy to share on their, their Instagram feeds, their, you know, their other, social, uh, other social platforms and things like that. So we'd, also, we'd had a little bit of a conversation prior and I'm like, you know, how do you want to be photographed? And they were like, oh, mum, don't, don't dress me up and don't do this and don't do that. So I wanted it to be them, just natural um, and all about them and something that they'd be happy to share. So I've got my two photographs there. 
and you can see they're really, really simple and they are a little darker. I've got them in darker shirts. They wore darker shirts because they wanted to. They don't wear bright, colorful clothing. Um, they're a bit like me and, um, and I put them on a dark background so I lit them that way. So when we think about that whole editing process and how we can get the most out of you know, our photographs, it all comes back to how you capture them and it's getting your exposure right, getting your lighting right, getting the posing right, spending the time to get the hair right, things like that. And then that way when you come into you know, your post-production programs, whether it be Lightroom, whether it be Photoshop or both or however you do it, you don't have to do too much to the photograph. Like I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, there's not really a lot that I want to do. I'm going to, you know, tone down these little pants down here in the bottom right hand corner because it's dragging my eye away. Um, I can see a little bit of his arm over here, so I might just crop it in a bit tighter. I'm going to fix up a little bit of the redness around the eyes and, and the chin and so forth and tidy up his skin. So really there's not a lot I need to do. And whereas if I'd got it wrong in camera, I would definitely have to, to do a lot of sort of, you know, retouching in terms of adjusting the, the direction of the light and things like that. Um, with Ken's, um, <laughs> I love this perfect picture of her sweet face. There's probably a few things looking at this photo that I might just crop it in a little tighter so it's not so, um, not so high there on her leg. Let's just come out just a little bit there. So I might just sort of crop it in, you know, down a little bit higher like that so I don't have any of her shorts and so forth, just a little bit there so you can see that she's obviously wearing pants. Um, and you can see right here where that light is coming across her face, this area, which is quite fair, um, is, is a little bright, but her face is just that little bit darker, so I might just sort of lift the exposure there a bit on her face and so forth. But yeah, there's not a lot that I need to do other than like with Alex, you know, lighten the, the reds around the eyes there and remove some of those blemishes on the skin, which is very typical of this age. So I obviously I am going to show you how I do a lot of stuff in post-production, but if you really do want to get into, um, you know, improving your editing and retouching skills, I do have a lot of different tutorials on newbornposing.com. You can go to the editing section and there are tutorials from beginner, so the fundamentals of Photoshop, learning what all the different tools do and how to use them, right through to more advanced sort of award editing techniques that I use. So I am going to cover a lot here, but obviously not everything um, with these two photographs. So if you want to know more, that's where you can find those tutorials. And again, um, when you are sort of looking for previous videos that we've done in the group here, make sure that you go to the video section and the announcements section of the group and you will find all of our previous videos that we've shot here, everything that we film live, it stays recorded in the group. It doesn't come down, so you can go back and re-watch over and over again, which is fantastic. And I've also got a YouTube channel, um, which I've had for many, many years, and Garrett's been uploading all of the videos that we've done here there as well, so you can go and watch them on YouTube, which is pretty, pretty cool. So. Um, Lee's got a question. So oh, you were fantastic. talking about lighting just before. So what about if I'm outside? Should I worry about getting the light right on the children and then not so much worry about the background? Ah, so this is the thing. If you are shooting outdoor on location and if you're trying to sort of, you know, capture beautiful sunsets and things like that behind your subject, then you're probably going to want to introduce some type of off-camera flash, some reflectors, things like that, so you get the exposure right on the kids. If you don't have those sort of things, then you might need to do like two exposures, one of the, the subject and one of the background, and then you can put those to, together in post. There are many ways to obviously get the best outcome, but yes, you do want to try and get that lighting right, whether you are inside or outside. So yes, using some off-camera flash um, in terms of being outdoors, so you can make the most of the, the beautiful skies and, and light in different times of the day, uh, as well as getting those, um, um, those lighting, the lighting exactly right on the skin and the subject to make it as easy as possible for you in post-production. Alrighty. 
Um, let's have a little look here at my settings. Okay, so I've opened up both of my raw files. Um, now the color temperature here as shot, and these are raw files and I'm in camera raw, um, it's a little warm for me, so I'm gonna bring that color temperature down just a little bit. So we might bring it down to 5,600 and have a look at that. And we'll get rid of some of those magenta tones and bring that back there. Now, I know in, in Camera Raw, you can make a lot of different adjustments here. You can adjust the shadows if you wanna bring those up a little bit. But I'm pretty, there we go. And don't need to worry about any highlights there. You can. I don't tend to make too many global adjustments. And let's have a little look at Alex here. And I'll bring those magenta tones down a little bit as well. And we might bring up those shadows just a tad. Give us a little bit more detail to play with there. All right, I don't need to go into to lens correction. Um, you can sort of see like there's a little bit of a difference there. I might leave that on. Let's have a little look at, look at Ken's. Yeah. Alrighty, so let's open those up. So like I said, there are so many different ways for you to get the same results in post-production. And how I do it might not necessarily be the way that you do it. So um, that's okay. Keep doing it the way you'd like to do it. And everything will be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Garrett's going to let me know if you guys have got any questions whatsoever. I will, I will. Alrighty, so I'm having a look here. We'll start with Ken's. And if I'm going to crop an image, um, I want to make sure, obviously, that I'm going to use the different ratios down the side here. And I'm not going to crop it up the top here in terms of, um, you know, by X amount of inches by X amount of inches and then by a certain DPI because then it's obviously going to vary. It's going to remove a lot of information and it's going to reduce the size of that file and it's only going to print to that size that you obviously specify. So by choosing the different ratios, um, this is where you're obviously going to keep the, the maximum amount of information in that file without removing too much. But I do prefer to get my crops as right as I possibly can in camera without having to crop them later on. And I usually stick to this um, four by six, two to three ratio purely because uh, if I am working on a client image, I don't know what size print they're going to order. So I wanna keep all the information in there so that if I do have to crop it to a certain you know, frame size um, for whatever package that they're ordering, then it's gonna work. But I do wanna just bring it in a little bit there to the top of that leg. I might just get rid of that little pointy elbow there. Make it more about her little face. And I'm going to darken down this area over here as well to help draw that, um, draw your attention back up. And I've kind of gone there. If you have a look at my rule of thirds, I want her little face sort of in the center of that frame. Come up just a bit more there. And, um, and she's sort of evenly spread there throughout the frame in terms of balance. Um, Jason's got a question. Are there benefits over doing similar adjustments in Photoshop as opposed to Lightroom? Uh, would Photoshop do a better job, for example, applying vignettes, adjusting curves, that sort of thing? Do you know, um, no, there's no benefits. It's just what you prefer to use. Lightroom is um, an incredible platform to, you know, pro um, program to use to edit your photographs with. It's just for me, I know that I can pull a photo into Photoshop and I can do everything here that I can do over there. But there are definitely other benefits to using Lightroom. It's just what you prefer to do and how, you know, how your current process is in terms of how you make it work for you. So yeah, uh, I know a lot of my friends that are photographers, their, their process is they open it in Photoshop and then they, I mean, sorry, Lightroom and then they bring it in um, into um, Photoshop and, and do other adjustments there, but it's obviously what you are used to. So yeah, I, this is how I do it and I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely no, um, you know, no, um, what did you say? Like no benefits one over the other. Both amazing platforms. All right, so let's start here with adjusting the light. Um, whenever I do things like this, I've got a lot of actions that I use, and then obviously I'll use either curves or levels um, to make sort of other adjustments as well. But I've got different actions up here, light and darken, and then I use my adjustment levels. And you can see I've got all of my different things that I need to 
to use over here to my right hand side um, and I've got my my you know my I suppose what do you call this my workspace. my workspace set up the way that I'm used to it so obviously everyone's workspace is going to look slightly different it's just what you're used to and what you um, I'm are comfortable sure Michelle's with. got a, um, a blog post on workspaces and how to make Photoshop work for you so absolutely check that out so I've just opened up a, um, a curves adjustment layer here and what I'm going to do is I've clicked on the little hand here and if you can see the little dot moving there over the skin there's the information of that so I just want to bring those skin tones up because Ken's has got quite fair skin so I've underexposed it slightly here because you can see on the cheek there on that brightest part that information is sitting here so I know I've got a fair bit of room there to move with that skin. I haven't necessarily underexposed it but I just want to brighten it a little bit and I'm just going to lift that information up just a bit there. And then if I invert that layer mask, now why didn't that work? My computer's having a bit of a conniption here, Garrett. Oh no. And it's because Photoshop is. Let's do this again. When I'm ever I am um, plugged in. Let's see how we go. It's not doing anything. It's moving the information, but it's not giving me any. I'm not seeing it either. No. All right, let's just do it this way. There we go. <laughs> so instead of using adjustment layer, I've just done a copy layer and I am, um, you can see me lifting that information there. Now I'm gonna add a mask and invert that. A couple of questions here about fine art images. So Trish says, amazing, can you show us how to create a fine art image, especially with regards to skin? And then Sherry, will you be doing painterly fine art edit today? No, definitely not. These are not the type of photographs that I would edit that way because I didn't shoot them with that intention. And I think that's the whole point. So let me just come down here and I'll show you what I've been working on at home. I'll just. So this is something that I've been playing with that I shot at WPPI for a creative child portrait. And you can see that's edited a very, very different, different way to how I'm going to edit today because like I said, I've just taken a very classic basic portrait of my twins for their Instagram pages. So I wouldn't edit it like this um, because this is more of a fine art sort of creative concept portrait. So when you shoot with that in, in mind, then obviously you're going to edit the way that you have photographed that image for, if that makes sense. Because for me, when I'm working, I suppose, on an idea and a concept, it, it the way that I visualize that finished photograph, that finished print, will be the way that I, I plan out the entire process from concept to shooting, to lighting, to editing, to, to printing. So, Whenever you take a photograph, you've always got to have that final finished photograph in the back of your mind. So I'm just going to do a really clean edit here because I've shot them very clean, very basic, very simple. So it's more of a classic portrait. So when you, um, you know, are editing, the, I wouldn't spend hours on these portraits because I didn't shoot them with that in mind. So um that's that's something to always consider when you want to do more sort of fine art portraits you do have to light them in a particular way um just lighten those darker areas there and when i'm sort of light light adding light to certain areas of a photograph like this i follow the way that the the actual light that i was using has lit her um, just add a little bit more light to the hair there. And oh, she's got a little bit of red hair under here that she was kind of hiding, but that would make her very happy if we could see that. <laughs> so whenever I do edit, another thing I often do is I will reduce the size of the file. Um, on my screen I often zoom right out and then zoom back in like this so that I can see what's grabbing my eye another trick is to flip it upside down things like that but yeah it's um, 
And if you ever do get to a point when you're editing, it's always a good idea if you don't know what you're missing or if you can see that you want, you know, it needs something else but you're not quite sure what it is, just to get up and walk away and give yourself a little bit of time and then come back. So when I'm working in layers like this with masks, um, obviously a black layer, I'm, it's, it's, I've removed that layer from the file and now I'm painting that layer back on to wherever I need it. So you can see if I hit the backslash key, that's where I've kind of painted. And then obviously if I paint it on anywhere, I can take that off as well by switching my brush back to a black brush. And I do love kind of using some of these beautiful shadows in here. Deborah says, flip it upside down, question mark, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> it just allows you to see the image um, a little differently, differently and yeah. see what you might be missing. If there's any bright bright highlights or anything that's um, uh, distracting in the photograph that you might need to kind of tone down or or um, remove. Alrighty, so I've added the light where I kind of needed it to be, but now I want to darken down some of those um, areas. So I'm just going to create another curves layer here and a copy layer, go up into curves, and then you can see the information that being quite bright down here. So I'm just going to tone that down just a little bit. And then add a layer mask, invert that, and paint that on where I need it to be. And you can see the opacity in my brush is really quite, quite sort of low there because I like to kind of build it and um, and only paint on. Anne's got a great question. Um, how long would it normally take you to edit an image? Well, it depends on the photograph. Um, so with with the twins today, you know, I'm obviously going to explain a few things as I go and talk, so it might just take a little bit longer, but usually when I'm editing, you know, just a, a standard kind of client image, a clean sort of portrait from a newborn session, then I probably wouldn't spend any more than five, five minutes on the photograph. Uh, it depends on the skin as well, like if a baby's got quite sort of flaky, um, dry skin, but uh, yeah, I'm probably not going to spend too long. So you can see, just turning that down now, Ken's face is the brightest part here of the, of the photograph. It's amazing how when you zoom out, as soon as you said that, that's the first thing that you could see. It's kind of like an artist would stand back from their painting yeah. before they move on. All right, so now I'm going to adjust those skin light and skin reds. Now these actions that I'm going to use, they're part of my workflow action set and they just make everything a lot easier when I am editing and that's when we talk about time, length of time that we spend on a photograph, you want to reduce your editing time by creating you know, different actions, using different actions, but obviously when you are working with actions, you need to know, um, you know all the basic fundamentals of Photoshop so you can get the most out of the actions that you are using because there are no actions out there with a one-click fix. They're not going to fix your photographs. It all comes down to knowing how to get that capture right in camera. And then obviously knowing how to apply actions in a way that you're only applying them to the area that you need them applied to. Deborah actually says here that she uses your actions. She's got others, but yours are her go-to. Oh, thanks, Deborah. Um, Sherry asks, do you use pressured settings on your brush um, when no. you build up the strokes? I don't, and this is the, the thing. It's, I'm, a, I'm a very basic editor. Um, in terms of I don't overcomplicate things, I just keep it really simple. Um, I just use a standard brush. Okay, so you can see where I've applied that. And if we do zoom in, you can I'll turn that off so you can see how it's kind of taken some of those reds out oh, wow. around the eyes there. And it helps soften down a lot of those blemishes as well. Okay. 
Okay. What I'm going to do down here is just have a look. A, little, a few little marks down here. A couple of little stretch marks, which are very common. This kid is growing so fast. Both of the twins are extremely tall for thir 13. So just reducing those. All right, so whenever I do remove some skin tones, I'm sorry, skin reds, um, I may need to sort of bring up some of those, um, those warmer tones uh, because you can make them look a little cool when you remove a lot of those red tones. So I'm just gonna warm them up and I'm just gonna go to my correct the blues here. And again, a nice low opacity, just kind of warm up those skin tones to match the rest of her. Give her a bit of a tan. Bring down here. Oops. So Monica, I'm pretty sure she made a post on the weekend in the group. She finally got um, the Pro 1000 and was struggling to figure out how to match the print to the edit and yes. it was fun. <laughs> ah, oh, I did make a comment on your yes. post about ICC profiles. So when you start printing yourself, the paper that you choose to print on, each type of paper has its own profile, printer profile. So when you, when you open up your packet of paper, obviously it's going to have a, a brand and a type of paper and a GSM, a weight and all of that kind of stuff. You can go to the website of the, the, the type of paper. Obviously we use Canson Infinity paper here. So whenever I try a different type of paper, I've got to make sure obviously that I've got those ICC profiles loaded into my system. Now, I go to the Canson Infinity website and I can go to their printer profiles section and I can download and install all of those ICC profiles and all of the instructions to do that will be on the website of the, the paper maker that you've chosen, whichever type of paper that you're using. Um, and then when I go to print, I make sure that I'm choosing the right ICC profile for that type of paper. And that's going to give you a much better match in terms of what you're seeing on your screen to what you're seeing in your final print. But there are different types of papers that are going to give you a slight different um, you know, result. Some papers are quite warm. Um, some papers are quite cool. So when we think about white, there's a million different types of white papers out there. It's, they're all going to have a different profile. So it's, if you want something to come up really, really white, obviously you're gonna choose a different type of paper for that as a result. So not knowing obviously what type of paper that you're using and printing on and, and you know, whether or not you've installed those pro uh, profiles correctly, go to the website of the company of the paper that you're using and you're gonna be able to download download and install them as per their instructions and I guarantee you will see a much different result. But when we had Rocco on here last week, Rocco and Cora, we talked a lot about obviously different color profiles and things like that. Um, Rocco has created some tutorials that are going to be released soon that is going to show you how to get the most out of printing and all of that. So this is not an area of my expertise, definitely not. Um, but he is the best person to explain that. So as soon as those um, tutorials are available, we'll share them. But yeah, go to the website and have a look at those ICC profiles. Alrighty. Okay, so now I'm pretty much ready here to start sort of working on the skin. I didn't really have to do too much. Let's take a little snapshot here and we'll go back to our raw file and then to here and you can sort of see the difference of her face compared to and the leg and we've warmed it up a little bit more so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start softening the skin so I'm going to use my skin softening um, my soft baby skin from my um, beautiful skin set and this is where I will paint this action on at 100% because I want to get a really even coverage it's like when you put foundation on your own face for the ladies that wear that. So it is a little strong at 100%. Everything good? All good. I will change battery soon. 
So I am print, I'm painting this on like with a nice soft edge, just right click there to show you. The edge of my brush is nice and soft and I am avoiding the edge of her skin. When you're using actions like this, when you start to come too close, can you see how that's giving that, that glow here around the edge there? So you can see how it's blending in with the colors and the tones past that. This is where you've got to be really careful and not get too close to your edge there. Um, because that's something that I often see in a lot of photographs. And which action is this that you're using, Kelly? This is the soft baby skin out of my beautiful skin set. So there's a lot of different skin softening actions and things out there. Um, I find when I am softening skin and, you know, smoothing out tone and texture, that I want to keep as much texture as I possibly can in the skin. I am painting, painting this on at 100%, but what I'm going to come back and do is adjust the opacity. So you can see, turn that backslash the guide on there so I can see where I've missed come down here while you're doing some painting now I'm just going to do a quick battery change okay in one moment With Alex, you know, I'm probably not going to use. Oops, you got me out, haven't you? You're right. You're back. I'm back. <laughs> I've just got the spinning wheel of death here, so we'll just wait a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I am plugged in um, to projectors or anything like this or other programs, Photoshop loves to take its time. Now, what I'm going to do, guys, is something that I really did not want to do, but I am going to force quit Photoshop and open these up really quickly and get back to where I was. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, do you edit in 16-bit? Um, I do when I need to. Um, my, my raw files are anywhere. <laughs> do you ever have an issue with your scratch disk? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I normally edit upstairs on, you know, a, a much larger computer with my ASO monitor. But during, for this, it's, if I had a big ASO monitor and a computer in front of me, I'd be doing this the whole time to, to look at you. <laughs> so we do use my laptop for this, but um, yeah. You know what, um, when you are obviously editing in 16-bit, you're going to have so much more information to work with there. But with these really simple, quick portraits, I don't plan on putting these photographs anywhere except for on my wall. And I'm probably not going to print them any bigger than an 11 by 14. And I know how big my raw files are. They're anywhere between 50 and 60 megabytes. I'm not going to be making any major changes in post-production. Whereas if I'm working with more of a fine art print and I know that I'm going to be doing a lot to that photograph then I want to work with as much information as I possibly can. So I'm not changing these images too much in post-production. I am literally just giving them a quick polish and that's what I wanted to share with you. So let's try this again. Yay for fun times. <laughs> So that's, it saved the information there before, which is fantastic, the changes that we made. Alrighty. As far as using a Wacom, Kelly, there's a bit of a, I suppose, a statement more than a question here. Had a Wacom tablet for a few months, didn't love it at first, kind of just sat there, took it out two weeks ago, and I wonder how I did without it for so long. Like, as far as using a Wacom, I know I struggle. Um, but I don't, I don't have a, a purpose for using a Wacom. But when when you really do want to get into it, well, I suppose what's some tips? Do you know it? Like anything, it does take a while to get used to using something new. And for me, my Wacom tablet. Oh gosh, I could not use a mouse or any other way of editing now because it's I'm, it's just what I'm used to. And I think it 
you know, you just have to give it time. You've got to give it a chance. I don't use any of the functions down the side because I use a lot of shortcut keys on my on my keyboard. So, but you can obviously use a lot of the different shortcut functions on the Wacom tablet. I choose not to, but that's entirely up to you. Um, now I'm just using my actions as opposed to showing you the curves process that I did before just to kind of darken and lighten some of these areas very quickly. To get back to where I was. So you can see I'm going through this really quickly. That's how I normally edit when I'm um, not showing or having anyone watch. <laughs> And that's the thing, like if it works for you and as long as you are using non-destructive techniques to edit your photographs, you are going to be fine. But the thing is, um, it's understanding, I suppose, all the different fundamentals, all the different tools, how to get the most out of them. Using adjustment layers and um, masks is going to be very beneficial to you. Now, Ollie has got a question here about um, what type of hard drive to use, Seagate, Passport, Toshiba, you know, where to back files up to. It's probably going to be answered later on this week. Yeah, um, is that Wednesday? Michelle Kenner joins us. Um, I yes. think it is, it's Wednesday. Yeah, let's go with Wednesday. So on Wednesday, Michelle's actually going to be broadcasting in live and joining us here because we're going to talk a lot about file storage. So when Michelle joined us, she basically gave us a complete overhaul in terms of how we back up and store all of our files to make it more efficient, make it easier to find um, everything. And because she had such a great system already in place. I mean, I had a system, but it wasn't the best. So it worked, but it wasn't the best, like I said. So we needed, obviously, to give it a big overhaul. So we thought it'd be fun for Michelle to join us and um, talk through a lot of that process. But for us, we have here like a RAID system. So it's a large, um, a large storage device, but we also store a lot of files uh, on, um, on, in the cloud as well. I was gonna say on the line. <laughs> on the line, same thing. <laughs> but no, I think that'll be a, um, a great class that we haven't really touched on too much before, so. Yeah. So I've got back to where I was with that file and um, now I'm going to paint that skin softening action back on and let's just hope that Photoshop plays, plays our game here. I'm doing this really quickly. So I hope everyone had a great weekend. I can see lots of different crafting ideas and things like that coming out. This Thursday, I'm going to be creating, someone challenged me to create a tree of life. It's not something that I actually had on my radar to create. Um, hadn't really thought about doing a tree of life. And anyway, so I've been doing my research and looking for lots of different inspiration and places to find different structures and um, paintings and uh, things. Now, if I hit that backslash key, you're going to see how messy my painting is. <laughs> That's the great thing about that backslash key. I remember the first time you showed it to me, I was like, oh my goodness, I can actually see where I've missed things. Yeah, I love it. Now, that is the, on a Mac, it's the backslash, backslash key is above the return key. So that's given me a nice even coverage there. So when we talked before about skin softening, it seems to have worked this time. You know, avoiding, obviously, avoiding um, eyes, mouth, uh, the edges, all of those things. So I've got that on there at 100%. This is where I bring the opacity of that down to where I can start to see that texture in the skin. So I'm gonna go anywhere between 60 and 70% and you can still see at 63% it's made a huge difference there. Um, I wouldn't do that as much obviously with Alex because he's a boy, he doesn't really need, um, need skin softening. <laughs> okay, so with Kins, we talked about lips before. Um, there's a few different ways that you can make lips nice and 
nice and pink and soft. Obviously, I've got my soft pink cheeks and things like that, but uh, a quick way is you can create an adjustment um, layer down here, or you can use your brush and change the brush mode. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to hold the Option key in here, and I'm gonna select one of these kind of nice, pinky kind of juicy tones in here, maybe around in here. And I can come over here to my adjustment layers and I can go solid color. This is just one way to do it. And go okay and then change the, the layer mode here to kind of have a look at how it's going to work. I'm gonna come down here to soft light or maybe overlay. And if you want it to be darker, you could go to multiply. So if we go to soft light, that's just gonna add that little bit of contrast with that color tone. And what I can do here is paint it on. I'll paint it on at 100% so you can really see it. But whenever I do do this, it's usually at the lowest opacity, like I'm talking five, max 8%. But Ken's doesn't wear lipstick, so I'm not gonna give her lipstick. <laughs> but yeah, if I bring that opacity all the way down to five, it just gives those lips that little bit of oomph. It's very subtle. Maybe up a little higher there. There we go. Because I'm not changing the color of them, I'm just giving them that little bit of bump. But um, I don't think she really needs it there because we're keeping it really soft and subtle. All right, so um, this is where I'd probably come in and I'd give it a little bit of contrast. I can use an action for this or I can basically just use my curves. So in a new copy layer, Command J, Command M to come into curves. And this is where I'm going to focus on the contrast of that skin and giving it a bit of a bump. So I'm gonna hold the Alt key in here, sorry, the Option key, and I'm just gonna bring my little black slider in and I can see obviously where I'm losing information there. It's not giving me my guide, there it is. So I don't wanna to lose too much information. I wanna come into anywhere about nine or 10. And then with my whites, you can see there's the guide. That's where I'm starting to lose information there, obviously in those highlights. We don't want to do that, so I'm just going to bring that back out. Add a layer mask, invert that, and now I'm going to paint that on um, with a white brush onto the skin. And I've reduced the opacity there to about 50%. Just give her a little contrast. As far as the tools go, the preset tools on the side, do you ever use the dodge tool? No, I find they're quite destructive. When, when you are using them um, in terms of the information. So they, uh, they're not my go-to when it comes to dodging and burning. I'd rather use a 50% gray layer or use curves and create two different adjustment layers in terms of um, bringing up your um, highlights and then bringing down your, your shadows and, and painting or mid-tones and painting those ones. So you can see just a little bit of contrast gives that um, skin that bit of pop there. Now, if I did want to um, use, do a little bit of dodging and burning here, my 50% gray layer is always gonna be my go-to when we talk about dodging and burning. I'm gonna bring the opacity of my brush down to about four. I've got a black and a white brush there selected. You could do this twice and add, name one um, layer lighten and one layer darken and do it that way. Or if you're anything like me and you just want to go through real quick and add a little bit of highlights and um, the shadows to different areas to kind of emphasize them. I'm going to bring my brush in nice and small. Let's bring it down to about three. Good morning, Danielle Fisher. Hey, Dan. So yeah, just some of these little darker areas just around her eyes. I'm just going to lighten those there. Not too much. I can come around. Like I said, this is just a really quick edit. I don't want to change the way she looks. She's beautiful. But she's got a few little darker areas here around her eyes. And just lighten those brown eyes there because brown eyes can can go quite sort of dark. I 
Yeah, it's sometimes, you know, I find when I'm editing, it like if I've got a big backlog of editing, it takes me a while to get into the zone. I don't know about you, but like I'll put it off because I, I'm overwhelmed by how much I've got to get done. Whereas if I just sat down and I started it, I'd get into it. But for the first time in a long time, I'm pretty much caught up <laughs> um, on most of my editing. I've got one more creative portrait to edit and I'm done there. And then I've got some personal projects that I've got that have just been sitting there. So I'm, I'm excited to start working on those because um, I had been putting them off because I was so overwhelmed with my workload but the thing is when you have an editing workflow it doesn't take long to kind of get through your um your images sherry says this is her favorite part and she loves your 50 percent gray layer <laughs> <laughs> well you can see just by doing that i've managed to kind of lighten some of those darker areas around kenza's eyes and I'm doing this super quick, guys, because I know that, you know, it can get a little boring watching someone edit. See, I find this fascinating. I've always been able to just sit there and watch you edit for hours <laughs> on end. Well, and I'm, and trust me, like a lot of people who teach retouching and things like that would look at the way that I do things and go, well, <laughs> but that's the thing. We all have our own style, our own system. And I know that the results that I get, they work for my clients, they work for me, and I'm okay with that. And there are many different ways to, to getting the same sort of results in post. Deborah's just giving you a reminder there that this is not boring. Let's <laughs> lighten some of these shadows here on the hair. Yeah, I have my favorite spot when I'm editing um, at home. When I'm just catching up at home, I've got this little area that I sit down on. I'm, I'm low to the ground. It's my comfy spot, I call it. And yeah, that's where I, I kind of hang out while my kids are watching TV or my husband's watching TV and so forth. And that's the thing I don't have. Like I set myself up where, you know, the light is nice and consistent when I'm editing. So all I have to do now is kind of come in, have a little bit of a, a go at these um, blemishes and we're done. If I wanted to keep kind of going with this, I could darken down some areas down here on the thigh where it's a little brighter. So a new copy layer, when I'm doing my blemishes, I use the patch tool and the spot healing brush. So let's go here first. Whenever I do do this, I don't zoom in any more than 200%, unless of course this is going to be blown up really big or I'm editing for an award image or something like that. But when it's just an everyday kind of portrait, um, and it's just going to be printed a normal size, there is no point in zooming in to 400% because you would be there all day trying to remove every single blemish. And I suppose when you do that, you kind of end up with really flat looking. It loses, loses some of the, the, texture, the texture. Yeah. yeah. So I just come in and then I just remove anything that's not supposed to be there, anything that's not going to be there in a couple of weeks when I'm going with that clinic fresh sort of very basic edit everyone's obviously mesmerized because there are no questions okay that's good <laughs> maybe i'll refresh and see see if something's frozen on facebook 
Everyone's gone deathly quiet. They're probably um, watching something else. <laughs> Netflix at the same time. We do time. have a couple of people who have said that they're um, editing whilst listening to you. It's very peaceful. Uh, perfect. So if Ken's was, you know, around that sort of 18, 17, 18, like if I was editing Georgie, I'd come in and I'd fix her eyebrows because she'd be like, oh, mum, fix my eyebrows. But, um, you know, being 13, I don't need to change anything here. This is Ken's, this is who she is. I don't want to change the way she looks. She doesn't have any wrinkles. Good morning, Sharon Jones. Hi. Okay. So yeah, you get the picture. I'm gonna come in and fix this up a little later, but we'll just get the majority of these done. Kayla says that she should actually be editing at the moment, but she's a little distracted. <laughs> <laughs> So you can see just by removing some of the, and I've come out a little bit in terms of my zoom, but I've just removed some of those blemishes there. Let's take a little snapshot here. Or oh, we'll come back to before and then after. And then if I was to um, want to sharpen this, then I've got lots of different sharpening actions and so forth. But yeah, a really quick way to sharpen a new copy layer, Command J. Come up to filter, come down to other, come down to high pass. This is one of my favorite ways to sharpen. So you can see it's kind of pretty intense there at 12. So maybe knock it back to about nine. That's a bit better. And then I'm going to adjust the layer mode here. We can go soft light or overlay looks pretty strong there. Let's go soft light and then add a layer mask and invert that command I. And then I'm just going to paint that on where I want to sharpen this image, which is going to be around her sort of eye area, around her mouth. You can see before and after, and that's a nice quick way to, to sharpen that image. So yeah. Kelly, can you recall what your camera settings were for this um, yeah. uh, shutter speed, focal length? Okay, so I shot this with strobe, my bronze colors. And let's come down here and have a look at these. Um, I would have shot this at ISO 100 and I would have had my shutter speed at 200 and I believe that I shot this at F4. And then I think my light setting was at around 5.5 or 6, somewhere around there. Cause yeah, I do talk about that though in the live video where I shot this. Um, which was from the 3rd of April. So you can go to the videos tab or you can go to announcements and you can watch, you know, where I put the light and, all, and, and I talk about my different camera settings as well and what they were. And Lindsay asks, do you soften wrinkles when working with older clients? I'm guessing elderly? I may soften them, but sometimes I enhance them as well. It just depends on the type of portrait that I'm going with. If somebody asks me, to do that then I will but basically I use light to shape a person um, and if I've got a larger person that I'm photographing I will use light and the way that I pose them to slim them down in camera um, with the different lighting techniques and I teach teach obviously different lighting techniques in my lighting tutorials and then um, in post-production I don't tend to do too much but yeah, um, it all basically comes down to a conversation that I have with my clients at the time of the shoot. So I'm just using the patch tool here and I'm just having a, cup, a look at a couple of these little blemishy marks here on Kenzie's arm. And with blemishes, I see you do it all the time, but um, Monica asks, why do you remove blemishes last and not when you start the edit? So a lot of the different techniques that I use, like, you know, adding light, um, darkening down areas, using the remove skin reds, things like that, they will actually um, 
soften a lot of the blemishes and, and eliminate a lot of that. Whereas if I just went straight into this image, and let's have a little look here and we'll take a, a, another snapshot. Let's go back here. So if I went in and I started trying to remove blemishes now, there's a lot more there than what there was when I got to that point because I had a li like I had reduced the, um, I re I, what's the word I'm looking for here? <laughs> I had reduced the visibility of them throughout the different stages of editing. So yeah, uh, blemishes are the last thing that I tend to look at. So yeah, there's my beautiful Ken's. All right. Oh, she's stunning. I wish she was here. She'd be so embarrassed. Yeah, she would be. <laughs> okay, so looking at this dude, he is a bit of a dude. Uh, like I said, I wanted to darken down his shorts. Now, there's a couple of different ways I could do that. Um, I could obviously crop them out, but do I want to crop this image, you know, really tight? I do want to get rid of his little arm there off to the side. I do want it to be a nice sort of tight shot. And I can reduce, obviously, the shorts there and... I'm um, having a look at his arm and so forth. I don't really like cropping through arms like that, but in this particular instance, if we go back, I already did in camera, but that's okay because this is just a portrait of his face. So if I want to remove his, um, his shorts down here, I could actually use the color change action, which is going to be down here somewhere. Where did I put it? Color change action can be found at newballposing.com. <laughs> Again, this is my demo one. Alrighty, so we don't want him to be this color. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so uh, if you double click on the little little tab here, um, I do want to darken his shorts down and I want to make them gray. Um, look at that, it's a beautiful black and white. So I'm going to invert that layer mask and then obviously down here I've got my lighten and darken that are set to 1%. So what I'm going to do is I don't want to lighten it. I'm going to invert that mask, take it off, and then obviously I'll adjust that um, as I get to it. So what I'm going to do here is with my brush, I'm going to paint that on at 100% down here and change the color of those pants. Um, Monica's um, uh, back onto the blemishes. So does that work the same on newborns? How you always do the blemishes last? Yes, every time. To every time. And also, could you talk a little bit about the rule for cutting through limbs and when it is okay and when it isn't okay? Um, so usually, if you cut through um, like a foot or a hand or a wrist or something like that, so. Because I didn't have a lot of his arm here, obviously you can see that's an arm. If I cut, hang on, let's just finish this off and then I'll get to it. So I'm just using the darken part there to really darken that area down. So I've obviously changed the color and then I've darkened it down. So it's still there, but it's just uh, no longer as dark as what it needs to be. And I may just darken it down a little bit more. So we've fixed the short situation, but with the arm, if I was to have cropped it kind of here, then it's sort of like, it's not still not too bad, but there's, there's not a lot to show you where that arm's kind of going with, going. So here it gives you a bit more shape as the arm kind of bends through um, the bottom of the frame there. But if you cut through a wrist, then you've got a lot of arm and then no wrist. So you're better off cropping higher than lower. And then obviously through feet and things like that, um, it just, it can be very jarring. So, and obviously as you go out of the frame, this being quite bright down here, it can be a very sort of distracting, strong line that is gonna draw your eye towards the bottom of the frame and not keep you up in the face, which is what we want. So that's why I am gonna darken down that part there. So I can go back and use my darken action or I can go in and use curves again and grab my little hand and you can see how bright that information there is so i'm just going to darken it down a little bit and add a mask invert that and olia asks is there a tutorial on composition there's two actually there's one in photoshop fundamentals which is to do with the whole editing side of composition and then pretty much the whole of get it right in camera 
<laughs> there is, yeah. I'm just darkening down his neck here, just a little bit where those highlights are. There we go. So I've darkened down the arm and the, um, the, the leg there just a little bit more in the background. Okay, so now this is where I'm going to go into my reds. I like the light that's coming across his face here. So when I ever I open up an image, the first thing I kind of look at is, you know, the composition. Do I need to crop? Is the background okay? Do I need to fix, um, especially when I'm editing babies, any lines, wrinkles, things like that? Oh my God, he'd be mortified if I talked about this in front of him while he was here, but I keep trying to ask him to shave that little moustache off and uh, he won't because he's very proud of it. I don't know if anyone else has got teenage boys. It's like a shadow. Yeah, he's so handsome. So just getting rid of some of these sort of red darker tones there around the blemishes. When we talked before about removing blemishes, like a lot of this does get rid of those teenage spots, we call them. Okay, and I'm just gonna warm up his little face a bit to match the arm. Deborah's son loved his first moustache too. Yeah. <laughs> They're funny teenagers. You know, you always think as your kids are growing older that they'll get easier, but it doesn't. It's so different with every single age. All right, so that's pretty much all I, need, all I really wanted to do to Alex. Now this is where if I was going to use my, do a little dodging and burning, this is where I'd do it. Obviously we did it before, um, a little later on in the, st in the process, but I wasn't really going to do too much with Ken's and then I just got a little carried away. <laughs> so we better do it with Alex as well. Just lighten those shadows there just a little bit. And then obviously some of the little blemishes, I can lighten those too, which will reduce them. It's kind of cool after you know bringing up the topic of when to do those blemishes. Now we're seeing Alex from the beginning. You can kind of see each step has reduced uh, reduced a lot of the blemishes down, so you won't end up with as much at the end. Yeah. And I'm not going to skin soften Alex because I, I don't tend to do it with boys. Um, too much. I like to keep that sort of texture in their skin. Girls love to wear makeup and things like that, you know, put a little bit of foundation on. We want our skin to look beautiful and flawless and soft. Whereas boys, you know, it's 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 a little different. They don't mind looking a little a little rugged. A bit more rough and ready. Yeah. I could darken down his moustache for him, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought this would be cool just to show you, you know, the difference. I use all my, like a lot of people ask me, you know, oh, can you use your actions on? And I use the design to be used for everything. Um, it's just how you apply them and, and obviously the at, at what level of intensity you apply them as well. So. The cool thing with this Blander Brilliant is, um, you can see Alex's hair up here. I could sort of bring out a little bit more of his hair. And darken down bits as well that I don't want. And just put a little bit of extra light can see I've just toned down some of those little highlights up the back there. Instead of editing them out, I've just toned them down so your eye isn't as drawn to those. Go 
got any more questions? No, they've all gone quiet again. It's that mesmerizing point. Oh dear. <laughs> all right, so now a little bit of contrast. Command J, Command M again, same as before. Increase those blacks a little bit, bring up those highlights. You can see where I'm starting to lose the information there in the highlights, so I bring it back. So I've not done any, you know, like I've not put any tones or anything over these images. I've kind of left them as is because I wanted them to be really clean. I could add different, different tones if I wanted to, but I'm okay. I'm actually just gonna take this layer off his eyes in here so they don't go too dark because I've pushed those blacks. All right, and this is where I'm going to do a little skin retouching. That's at 200%. I could even come out just a bit with Alex. And I could use the patch tool, or I could use the, um, the spot healing brush, which I always find is nice and quick. There's a rocky hair on his face, <laughs> which does not surprise me in the least. So he's got a little scar there on his face as well. I'm not even going to remove that because it's so him. But it's up to you whether you do remove things like that, especially just for really simple portraits like this. Why do you flatten all the time? I always uh, have a ton of layers. <laughs> do you know what? I believe that's just me. It's a personal thing. But if I don't have to go back and make any further changes to those layers, I don't need them there. Um, and that's it. Like I'm editing these in such a clean way that, and I'm not making a lot of changes. So when I'm kind of do something, I, I don't need to come back and change that layer again. Um, it's, I don't need it. So I flatten it and then I start again on whatever it is I'm doing next. But if you are working on a photograph that is requiring you to do a lot of different changes, for example, an award image or you know a personal project or something that you didn't quite get right in camera, or if you're still at that beginning stage, possibly keeping some of those layers so you can go back to them to make further adjustments um, would definitely be very beneficial. But when you get to a point where you know what you are doing and you know that you don't need to go back and make any further changes to, um, to those layers, then close them. I'm uh, Ashley asks, what button do you hold to do multiple spot heels? Um, oh, is this because you can see yeah. the spots? This is because my program is really struggling right now. They don't normally stay there. Um, I actually have Kelly's computer wirelessly hooked up to our editing suite, so it um, it's does using lag a, lot a little of, bit. Yeah. It's kind of my fault, sorry. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> my, and do you know the Apple stores are all closed at the moment? But my computer is due to go in and have a little bit of a um, TLC um, at Apple. And I need a new computer, and it seems the graphics card is... Um, it's not working like yeah. it should be, considering what I paid for it. So we're going to have that looked at. When things get back to normal. Yeah. All right, now I'm just making the most of it. But yeah, it does, it's not supposed to do what it's doing right now. <laughs> it is kind of cool though, as far as the demonstration purpose, because we can all see it. 
Um, whereas normally it would go away immediately, like instantly it would be gone, so. Oh, I didn't like that. Sometimes when you are using different tools, There's just a few little spots on the shirt that were kind of grabbing my eye there. So I'm just going to come around and the shirt is obviously meant to have that motley look, but there's a few one few spots that are a bit bright. You could darken them down or you could use the patch tool. It's up to you. All right. So this is where now I'm ready to sharpen my image. I'm going to do the exact same way I did it with Ken's. Go up new copy layer down to high pass. And see that there. Change the layer mode down to soft light and add a layer mask, invert that and then paint that on where I need it. Okay so let's have a look at our before, before and after. These ho hands. Oh, wow. All right, that's it. Two photographs for my kids to share on their socials and have a little bit of fun with. With Ken's, I think I might just kind of give her cheeks a little bit of a, a pinky area. I've got myself pink cheeks. This is the thing. Sometimes it's very hard to know when to stop with your editing. Um, but what you do need to remember is, uh, look at that, that's a bit much. <laughs> Bring that down to about four maybe even 3%. So it's so subtle, you can barely see it. What was the shortcut you used to reduce the patch tool? Um, Command Shift F. So then you can fade the patch selection or you can go up to edit and you can come down to fade patch selection um, from the edit menu and then reduce that, which works brilliantly. And I'll show you here, if someone has dark circles under their eyes, but you don't want to remove all of all of that. So for example, let's Mackenzie doesn't, but let's just say someone's got really dark circles under their eyes, you use the patch tool. Um, then you can command shift F and just reduce the opacity of that and that will make a huge difference. So it kind of brings back some of the detail and the line so it doesn't look Yeah, flat, flat. and fake. Yeah. And see how it's just softened that area there and you could continue to do that I mean like I could keep working on this but I just want want it to look nice and natural alrighty we're just about at the end there but I'm done can I just say a big thank you to Deborah Monica uh, Sherry Olya for asking all your questions today you've yeah, been yeah thank you been keeping this alive and active. All right. So yeah, for these images, when I go to save them, obviously, um, you know, I'll, I'll save these photographs. I could save them as PSDs if I want to come back in. If I'd had all my layers, I could come back and make some adjustments if I want. But yeah, I would save that as a normal JPEG in the same color space that I've been working in. And then if I was gonna send it off to print, obviously I'd open back up, I'd size it for the print that I was going to order, I'd convert the, the color profile to whatever the print lab was, you know, was asking me to convert it to or so forth. But I print here in Adobe RGB on my printers. So I tend to leave them in that and I only change them for, um, for web, which is um, sRGB when I go to upload those to Facebook and Instagram and other different web places. Web places? Is web places on the line. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's it. I'm, um, I'm done with editing those. I hope that you guys enjoyed that and got a little bit out of it. I used some of my actions, which helped me speed up my process. 
and um, and I went with a really clean edit that suited the way that I photographed them. So obviously when we are editing it's a, a lot to, to consider in terms of the way that the photograph was captured, the way that you lit that photograph to, to create the, the right type of mood and so forth, and then obviously how far you want to take it depending on the age of the subject. Um, I could make them look completely different, and but it's not the way that they look and it wasn't the way that they dressed and it wasn't the way that I posed and captured them. So a lot of that goes into the process of how you visualize those photographs to look right when, you know, right when you're ready to print them. So a lot to consider um, when you are taking photographs and how far you're going to take them. So yeah, organizing and naming files, wish to get more information or tutorial. We're talking all about that on Wednesday. So join us here Wednesday. Michelle's going to be broadcasted in live and we're going to talk about file storage, how you look after your files, how you save those files, where you put them, how you name the folders so that it's easy for you to go back and find what it is that you're looking for. Because if you're anything like me, you'll have a mountain of hard drives and sometimes when you know the photograph but you can't remember when you photographed it or, um, or who the client's name was, it can be really hard to go back and find. So we're going to share lots of information about that with you on Wednesday. But we've got a lot planned for the week ahead. Um, I'm going to share an interactive PDF again with you today from, with all of last week's information that we touched on in terms of our lives and then obviously some more great resources that uh, will keep you very busy and active this week. So yeah, it's going to be a great week and I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be lots of fun and Thursday we'll get messy again. I'll do another crafting <laughs> day and create that tree of life. My brain is going crazy with ideas. Um, we've got a few other people that have shared lots of different challenges and things like that. So if you can think of something else that you would like covered that hasn't been covered before, then um, post it in the group. We'd love to, we'd love to hear it and see what you've uh, got in store for us. But yeah, we loved coming coming into the group and going live each day. And again, if you are looking for any of the previous photo, uh, videos that we've shared, make sure you go to the videos section or to the announcements section in the group. You can find a lot of information. There's also the files section where you can find all of the previous interactive PDFs with lots of free resources and content. And I can't think of anything else right now, so I'm going to go do some work. <laughs> Have a great rest of the day. Good night for those of you who are heading to bed. And I'll see you very early tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Take care.